I'm going to read the first six verses of Isaiah 38. Let me just kind of set the background to this passage here. Uh, the king at the time here is King Hezekiah. The prophet is obviously Isaiah. This is the book of Isaiah. This is a record of his prophecies and his ministry during the period of the kings. If you've been with us very long through the book of Isaiah, you will remember me saying that the Bible is not always in chronological order and that the book of Isaiah really fits within the book of 2 Kings because this is when Isaiah prophesies. He ministers during the period of the kings and the particular king of Judah right now is King Hezekiah. And so what we're about to read here in Isaiah 38 has to do with his near-death experience. Uh, God was merciful to him and extended his life. And this story is also found in 2 Kings chapter 20. So if, if we read this and you think, where have I read this before? Because you may have read it in 2 Kings chapter 20. But Isaiah has included it here in his scroll as well because it was something that occurred during Isaiah's ministry as well as occurring during Hezekiah's reign. So that's why you have it in 2 Kings 20 and also here in Isaiah 38. I'm gonna read the first six verses and here we go. Isaiah 38 verse one says, in those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and have seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. I've entitled my sermon today, Why Pray? Why Pray? Let's first pause and do just that. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this time now in your word as we open up the Bible. We pray that you would speak to us through this chapter here, through this account with Hezekiah. Uh, Lord, teach us some things about prayer. Uh, many of us are familiar with the topic, but probably not as many of us are actually praying. So Lord, help us that we might enjoy this uh, wonderful opportunity through prayer to commune with you, to connect with you. And Lord, slow us down, we pray, that we would take time to pray. Use this time in your word now to speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. A few years ago, uh, my wife Terry and I were uh, ordering Chinese food to be delivered to our house. And uh, so Terry was on the phone and she was uh, ordering the food and got through the food order and got down at the end of the call to the credit card. And so she was given the credit card information over the phone. And then, then all of a sudden, and I was standing there in the kitchen, I could see her expression. All of a sudden she's still on the phone and she got an expression of joy and then an expression of like confusion. And we kind of went back and forth, joy and confusion. And she kept saying, this is, this is what I heard. She kept saying, it's a special day. What? That's wonderful. What does that mean? Do I get free food? Is it like free delivery? Well, what, what does that mean? Why do you keep saying special day, special day? What do I get? And then she just had this look of confusion and she just said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you talk to my husband? So she handed me the phone. <laughs> so I took the phone. I said, hello, is it a special day? <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no special day, no special day. Wife gave me credit card. I want expiration date, expiration date. <laughs> I don't, I don't share that il illustration to disparage any culture. It's just a bit of a language barrier for the moment, and expiration date is what he wanted. It wasn't a special day at all. How does that fit into this story? I'll tell you. <laughs> like a credit card, we all have an expiration date. How do you like that? <laughs> and Isaiah the prophet has shown up to King Hezekiah and says to him, your expiration date is up. You better get your house in order. You're going to die. 
Now, I, I began thinking through studying the passage, wouldn't it be kind of cool if actually there was, if, if we were like, you know, a canned food item, if all of us were born with like an expiration date, like on our backside, you know? And so you always would know like when that day is gonna happen, and then you wouldn't be afraid, like, am I gonna die? Am I gonna die? Oh no, that's right, my expiration date's not up yet. And you would, you'd never be anxious or worried or fearful, you could plan accordingly. But on the other hand, if you all had an expiration date stamped on your backside, you'd be living recklessly until that day, probably. So God knows what he's doing. And he doesn't tell us in advance when your expiration date is. But in this case, he does. He says to the prophet Isaiah, I want you to go to King Hezekiah, and I want you to tell him, yes, he's sick, and he will not recover. His days are numbered. He's going to die. And Hezekiah hears this word. This is grim news for him. He's 39 years of age at this time. Nobody, you're, you're 39, you don't want to hear. I mean, it's the prime of your life. You don't want to hear, hey, you're, you're getting ready to die. And so this is the news that he's being told by Isaiah that he, because of his sickness, will not recover and he's going to die. Actually, I didn't read it, but further down in chapter 38, in verse 21, it tells us the source of his illness because it gives us the cure here in a moment in, in verse 21. But in verse 21, it tells us that he, his sickness is the result of an infected boil, which apparently has caused sepsis throughout his whole body. Uh, now the infection from the boil has, has spread throughout his whole system, and he's dying from this. It's a raging infection, and so Isaiah is sent by the Lord to tell him that he, that he will not recover. And Hezekiah, you know, maybe he's standing or sitting. I kind of picture that perhaps he's lying in bed because he's sick and, and that he rolls over because it does say that he faces the wall. He hears this news from Isaiah and then he turns and he faces the wall and he prays. He prays and his prayer is simple. And I want you to notice with me, we're, we're going to read it again in verse 3. His prayer is so simple, he doesn't even ask God for anything. He, he does, it's, it's not what, you know, if it, were, if it were me, I would be like, why do I have to die? I'm only 39. God, you know, help me and, you know, cure me and, 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 and save me and I don't want to die. And he doesn't do any of that. It's very interesting here. He doesn't ask God for anything. He turns with his face to the wall and listen to, listen to what he does. He appeals to the memory of God. He appe not even to the mercy of God. God's going to be merciful, but he appeals to the memory of God and because his prayer is just, Lord, remember that I've lived faithfully and devoted to you. Please remember that. Notice again, it's a very simple, short prayer. It's just verse 3. Look at verse 3. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. That's his whole prayer. And then it adds, and Hezekiah wept bitterly. So he's distraught. He's weeping. He hears this news. He knows. I mean, the word of Isaiah is true, so he knows that his time is short here. And, and he just prays this simple prayer, remember, Lord, that I've been faithful and devoted to you. And then he weeps. It's one of the simplest prayers. But God honored it. God honored it. And I love the way it also adds in verse 5 that God heard his prayers heard his prayers and saw his tears. Heard his prayers and saw his tears. In Psalm 56, verse 8, very interesting verse in the Bible. Psalm 56, verse 8 says that God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. God is acquainted with our grief and familiar with our suffering and knows when we are in anguish. Psalm 56, verse 8, he bottles up our tears and he writes them in his book. God sees, God takes note when we are in anguish. And this simple prayer of Hezekiah's was enough for God. It was enough. God had mercy on Hezekiah and he sent Isaiah back to tell him, I'll add 15 more years to your life and I will defend Jerusalem against the Assyrians. I mean, he... He goes even above and beyond. Hezekiah didn't even ask for healing, and God says, I'm going to heal you. And then God adds, and I'm going to protect Jerusalem from the Assyrians. Now, by the way, the, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29, that God is not a man that he should lie or change his mind. 
Okay, we are fickle like that, but God is not. He is constant. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God is not like a man that he should lie or change his mind. So did he change his mind here? He adds 15 more years to Hezekiah's life. Hezekiah didn't even ask for it. No, the fact of the matter is that God is consistent. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't lie. It was part of the will and intent of God that Hezekiah should live a longer life. But this was a moment of testing. Will Hezekiah get angry at God? Will Hezekiah curse God? Will Hezekiah get mad at Isaiah? Or will he turn his face to the wall and pray a simple prayer, remember me, Lord, and weep? And in response to that, God gave Hezekiah what I believe in the sovereign will of God was God's original intention for Hezekiah. But he wanted to see if Hezekiah was willing enough to humble himself to receive it. And so God was merciful, and he extends Hezekiah's life 15 more years. And it's interesting also to notice the method by which God heals Hezekiah. If you look in verse 21, I'll just refer to it, I'm not going to quote it, but in verse 21, God tells Isaiah to prepare a poultice of figs, like just kind of a, a mushy fig substance, and apply it to the boil. I'm sure that was a wonderful day for Isaiah. You know, I just, like God, God's like, Isaiah, I want you to make this mixture of, of uh, figs, and I want you to go ahead and put it right there on that boil on Hezekiah's body. What? I mean, do I have any rubber gloves for this, Lord? I mean, you know, do I have to touch the boil? And just, you know, I can just see Isaiah like, okay, Lord, you know. But, so he's putting this mixture of figs on the boil. This is what God told him to do. It's basically a medicinal compound here that, by which God is going to use this to extract the infection. Uh, now, please note, look, God is a God of miracles, and God can choose to heal somebody any way he jolly well wants to. But there are times when God will use natural means to accomplish a supernatural end. Okay? Don't despise doctors and medicine. Okay, listen, God is the ultimate healer, always. But God uses doctors and God uses medicine. God uses natural means to accomplish his supernatural purposes. For goodness sakes, in this story, God used a fig Newton. <laughs> so he can use whatever he wants. And so Hezekiah is healed here. And Hezekiah gets this extension on his life. And I just love the way that God honors a very simple non-demanding, broken man's prayer in response. So let's examine the role of prayer in the life of an individual. And before we actually talk about why pray, we need to first answer the question, what is prayer? I know it might seem a bit elementary, elementary to, to most of us, but in its simplest definition, prayer is connecting and communing with God. Prayer is connecting and communing with God. It is sometimes talking. It is sometimes just listening and not saying anything. It can be with words or just from your heart. There's no right or wrong way to pray. There is no designed or designated prayer posture. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, you can lift your hands, you can close your eyes, you can open your eyes when you pray. You can pray on the run, you can pray in public, you can pray in private. You can pray in the morning, you can pray in the evening, you can pray everywhere in between. But the main thing is, we need to pray. We need to pray. You say, well, I don't really have time to pray. I really can't afford to pray. You can't not afford to pray. I know that's a double negative, and you grammar teachers would really have a problem with that. But it, you know what I'm saying? We, prayer is so important, we can't afford not to. And we deny ourselves, and we rob ourselves of what, of what God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives because we don't take time to pray. We don't take time to seek His face. And the Bible actually exhorts us to pray in different places. For example, Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. In Colossians 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, says pray continually. Now, whenever you read in the Bible strong exhortations, one after another, it's given to us intentionally because what it says to us is it won't come naturally. We will get occupied, busy, and if it's not our own system of busyness, trust me, the enemy will try to make you busy so that you don't pray and seek God too. So between ourselves and between whatever the enemy tries to throw our way to keep us 
at a distance from God, those things will constantly be competing with us in, in our attempt to get alone with the Lord. That's why the Scripture constantly is telling us, devote yourself to prayer, continually pray. You know, because it won't come easily, it won't come naturally, but if we don't, we do ourselves a disservice. G.K. Chesterton uh, once said, quote, the difference between talking about prayer and actually praying is the same as the difference between blowing a kiss and actually kissing. That we can talk about prayer a lot, but unless we actually pray, we're, we're not really engaging with the heart of God. So, why pray? I'm going to submit to you five reasons to consider prayer. And this list could be exhaustive. You could come up with, I'm sure, much better points than I'm going to give you, but I'm going to give you just five so that together we can consider the importance of prayer. As we see just the example here of Hezekiah, I mean, it's not this long, laborious prayer. It's not, you know, he didn't go on and on and on. It was just one verse. Didn't even ask anything. Turns his face toward the wall, prays to God on behalf of God's memory. Lord, just remember that I've been faithful to you. And then he weeps bitterly, and God takes note of it. So here's the first thing. Why pray, number one? Because I may not receive what God wants me to have until I ask. I may not receive what God wants me to have until I ask. Now, it isn't that God delights in just withholding things from us, but I'm going to explain what I mean as, as I go through this point. First of all, in your Bibles, you can write down in the margin here, James 4, verse 2. James 4, verse 2 makes it pretty clear. You don't have because you don't ask God. That's what James 4, 2 says. You have not because you ask not. You don't have because you have not asked God. Now, by the way, Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 8, your father knows what you need even before you ask. So it's easy to get a little cynical about prayer, isn't it? Because if you think to yourself, all right, well, God is my father and he loves me and he wants his best for me. So if he knows what I need, and Jesus said in Matthew 6, 8, he knows what I need even before I ask, why bother asking? I mean, why doesn't he just give me what I want or what I need? Why doesn't he anticipate everything because God knows everything, and then just go ahead and deliver without my having to ask. What's the purpose in prayer? Why would God withhold things from me until I ask? Now, by the way, it isn't as if God withholds everything, everything from you and me. He wants us to ask. He certainly anticipates what we need, and, and you better believe there are many times that God lavishes upon us what we don't deserve, what we haven't asked for, because He's already anticipated our need, and He's taking care of it. It's just like, you know, as a parent, you wouldn't, you wouldn't treat your kids that way. Well, I'm not going to give you a single thing until you ask. That's not the way God treats us. You know, well, I see, I see Johnny, you have holes in your shoes, but I'm not going to give you a pair of shoes until you ask. I see that you're hungry, Sally, but I'm not going to give you any food until you ask. I mean, that's ridiculous. No parent treats a child like that. God doesn't treat us like that. But there are times, there are times where God is waiting for us to ask why. Because in asking, we're learning some things. Number one, humility in asking. You ever have a hard time asking somebody for something? You know, because you don't want to impose, you don't want to be a burden, so I don't want to ask, all right? Um, and we can treat God that way. Well, I don't want to impose. I don't want to ask. God is teaching us humility because it takes humility to ask. Okay, God, I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to ask. We also learn patience while we're waiting because between asking and when the answer comes, whatever that answer might be, we learn patience in our waiting. And we learn how to be grateful for what we receive after we receive in response to what we've asked. So we learn all these different things. So this is why God says, I want you to ask, because we learn to appreciate and respect and honor and worship the one who has provided for us what we've asked. We learn patience in our waiting. We learn humility in the process of asking. So it's not like God is just, you know, this manipulative dad in heaven who's just like, I'm not going to give you a single thing to you ask. But James 4, 2 says, you don't have because you don't ask. God is wanting us to step towards him. And God is wanting us to engage with the heart of our Father and say, Lord, Father, I, this is my request. This is my plea. This is my prayer. This is my desire. This is, this is my wish. This is my want. Now, listen, God as our Father, gonna, He's going to filter through all of our requests. 
all right? As our Father in heaven, He's, he's going to filter through all of this because some of the things we want, we don't have the understanding or the capacity to realize that some of the things we want aren't good for us. And God does. Don't think that God is a vending machine or a genie in a bottle. That's not what prayer is about. Well, I just, you know, throw up some prayers, pull a lever, and God's going to give me what I want. No. God is our Father, and as our Father, sometimes His answer is going to be yes, sometimes His answer is going to be no, and sometimes His answer is going to be not now. And we have to be willing to trust Him as our Father in heaven who always does what is best for us. But He says, I want you to come and I want you to ask. I want you to make your request known to me. I want you to ask. But now listen, there's a warning. Because in James 4, 2, when it says you have not because you ask not, James 4, 3 says, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Oh, so James qualifies the request there. He says, now, I want you to ask. I want you to ask God because the reason a lot of times you don't have is because you haven't even asked. But by the way, there's another reason why you don't get, and that's because you've asked, but you've asked with wrong motives. God is not obligated to deliver to us what we ask with wrong motives. And now you might be wondering, well, how can I know if my request is one with wrong motives? Answer, when you don't get what you asked for. (laughs) Now, that doesn't mean everything that you don't get that you asked for is because you prayed with wrong motives. But what it does mean is if you pray with wrong motives, you won't get what you asked for. Okay, not every, every time God says no, it's because we ask with wrong motives, but every time we ask with wrong motives, God's gonna say no. Why? Well, because God is sometimes protecting us from our own selfish ambitions that are not in step with his purposes and plans for our lives. So God's not a vending machine, and God's not a genie in a bottle. God is our Father. He's not at our beck and call to just do whatever we want. He is our Father in heaven who sometimes says yes, sometimes says no, sometimes says not now. Now, one out of three ain't bad. Don't get angry with God if he says no or not now. He knows what's best, but he wants us to ask. We can learn humility, patience, and have a deep appreciation for the wonderful, beneficent hand of God when we ask. Number two, why pray? because God delights to show himself strong on my behalf. In the previous chapter, if you go backwards to Isaiah 37, just look at Isaiah 37 with me for a moment, because in the previous chapter there, Isaiah 37, it recounts an occasion when the Assyrians were making serious threats against Jerusalem, and there Hezekiah is king in Jerusalem. And the Assyrians were encamped, thousands, tens of thousands were encamped around the city of Jerusalem. And the field commander of the Assyrian army is coming to the wall of Jerusalem there. He's on the outside now. The Assyrians have encamped and encircled Jerusalem. The field commander of the Assyrians is coming out by the wall, and he's trash-talking. And he's just like, and he's just, you know, like running off at the mouth, and, and he's just saying things insulting to the people of Judah, to the king of Judah, and to the God of Judah. So he's just, you know, he's just going off. He's just, beep, 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 beep. He's just like, you know, you, you think you, you guys can rely on your God and your God is nothing and don't trust Hezekiah. My king is a better king and you guys are going to get swallowed up and we're going to take over your city and, 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 and stop your praying because we have stronger gods and all this kind of stuff. He goes on and on and on saying all this stuff. Okay, well, it's one thing to insult the people of Judah. It's another thing to insult the king of Judah. But when he starts insulting the God of Judah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Hezekiah comes unglued. And what does he do? He prays. In chapter 37, look again here at chapter 37, verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Hezekiah had his moments of prayer for sure. He prayed to the Lord. This is what he prays, verse 16. O Lord Almighty God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. He just prays. He just appeals to to, to God in this way. Jump to verse 21. It says, and then Isaiah, son of Amoz, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, because you have prayed to me. See, God takes note of it. Because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, because you have prayed 
to me. Here's what God ends up doing further down in the chapter, verse 36. for something pretty serious here. Verse 36, Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. And when the people got up the next morning, they were all the, the dead bodies. I mean, God, God showed himself strong in a big way by defending Jerusalem and the people that he loves. And by the way, I think the reason why Hezekiah prays in chapter 38 when he gets this news about his coming death is because he saw the hand of God in what we have as chapter 37 in defending the city of Jerusalem. So in other words, prayer builds your prayer life. See, Hezekiah, I think in chapter 38, turns and faces the wall and prays that simple prayer because he knows God, God is powerful. I, I've seen him work in my life before in response to a prayer. That was chapter 37. So I know that God can work again in response to prayer. The more we pray, it builds our prayer life. Because as you pray, you can see answers to prayer. You can see the different ways that God worked in wonderful, miraculous ways. And it motivates you to pray more. See, this is what is happening here in the life of Hezekiah. And God is showing himself strong on behalf of his people. You know, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9 says that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Do you know that God is on the hunt for people that he can show himself strong to, whose hearts are committed to him? His eyes are roaming to and fro all over the earth. Who can I strengthen today? Who can I strengthen today? That's the heart of our Father. He delights to show himself strong on our behalf. Asaph would say in Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of your trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. This is what God says to us. He beckons us. Call upon me. Go ahead. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me, just as he did for Hezekiah. Number three, why pray? Number three, whoop. I don't want to give you a preview. <laughs> because prayer bends my will to the will of God. Prayer bends my will to the will of God. Let me spend a little bit of time on this one because this one's a little tricky, and, I, and I've heard some people who, who think differently, so I want to clarify. I have a will, and God has a will. Same with you. You have a will, and God has a will. Now, sometimes those wills align. What, God's want, what God wants is the same thing you want. And sometimes those things do not align. God wills something, you don't will it. So in those moments when my will does not align with the will of God, or when I don't know if my will aligns with the will of God. So let's say there's nothing clearly like in Scripture that, that I'm wishing or willing or wanting that is a conflict with God's will, but let's just say it's something about which I just don't know. You know a, a move, a career change, there's not a scripture or verse about it, so I, I'm not sure if this is God's will. So, so in prayer, what happens in prayer is, prayer helps to bend my will to the will of God. If it's already aligned, well then there's not much bending. But if it's not, then what happens is in my heart, God begins to move in my heart in such a way that I'm now just surrendered to the will of God. My will bent toward the will of God. Now, now, here's why I need to clarify this, because I've heard some people uh, over my years of ministry who take issue with this. They, they would say to you, it is a faithless thing to end a prayer saying, your will be done. And, and the reason is because some believe that in prayer, we should come boldly before the throne of grace. There's a Bible verse on that. And we should declare to God in faith, believing, and that if, if anything else other than a strong declaration of believing enters in, such as, if your will be done, then it's almost a statement of a lack of faith. And, and they will often quote out of James, James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, which talks about if, if, if you pray, uh, you need to pray believing 
Uh, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So you can look at a verse, a passage like that in James 1, 6 to 8, and it almost sounds like, you know, you just need to go and kind of assert yourself to God and, and not doubt, and this is what I declare, and make your statement and stand strong and, and be a person of faith. But the, but the issue is, what is the doubt that James is talking about here? Um, I think it's, it's incorrect to say that the doubt he's talking about is, is the doubt of faith because the interpretation can be, well, if, if, you, if you doubt what you're asking, then you show faithlessness and then you're not going to get what you want because you're a double-minded man. When in reality, I believe the doubt he's talking about is doubting God. If you doubt God, if you doubt that God is able, then, then you're a double-minded person. Why are you asking God for something that you don't really ultimately believe he's able to do? That's the double-mindedness. So the issue is in, in James 1, 6 through 8, don't ever doubt God because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could hope or imagine. But to defer to his will is not doubting God. That is a posture and a position of humility saying, okay, as my Father in heaven, I may not be able to see everything clearly. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now we see, but in a glass darkly, then one day I'll see face to face, and I'll know in part now, but I'll know fully then. So for the meantime, because I see things in a glass dark, I'm not clear about everything. I don't, I don't know everything that God does. I'm going to defer to the will of God. And I'm going to say, Lord, your will be done. And I'm going to make my request known. I'm going to say, Lord, th this is what I'm asking. This is my plea. This is my prayer. But ultimately, Lord, your will be done. And I'm going to trust that as my Father in heaven, you have my best interest at heart, so I defer. And prayer then helps to bend my will to the will of God. This, this is not weakness. This is meekness. This does not diminish your prayers because somehow you're not asserting yourself strongly in faith. You can have faith and still believe, but your faith and belief is in, the, is in God and His ability to accomplish those things in your life for your good and for my good. Okay, so don't doubt that God is able because He is able. But be willing in prayer to ask God to move your heart that it might bend to His will, that you might be in conformity with the will of God for your life. Look, Jesus modeled this for us. In Matthew chapter 6, his own disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray, which is a strong indication to all of us, isn't it, that we need to learn how to pray? Teach us to pray. And in the Lord's prayer, he starts out, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Pray that. Pray, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in, and in Gethsemane, when Jesus was in agony before the cross, he prays in Luke twenty two forty two. 42, he says, Father, if you were willing, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus was willing to defer to the will of the Father. And in prayer, we need to, to ask God, Lord, your will be done. And we bend our will to the will of the Father. E. Stanley Jones said, quote, prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God and cooperate with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from a boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but aligning the aligning of my will to the will of God, end quote. I got to go through these real quickly. My time has escaped me here. Number four, because prayer combats anxiety, fear, worry, and temptation. That's important, isn't it? We need to pray because it combats anxiety, fear, worry, and temptation. Folks, we are people of flesh. And in our flesh, there's times we're going to be afraid, we're going to worry, we're going to get anxious, we're going to feel tempted. And prayer helps us in that regard. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, great verses. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things, through prayer... And supplication, it's another type of prayer, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's wonderful, isn't it, when you can go into your prayer closet or in your car, wherever you might be praying, and you can be so anxious and fearful, and then you just spend some time in prayer, and then that peace that passes all understanding just ministers to that anxiety, that worry, and that fear. The same for temptation. 
In the garden in Matthew chapter 26, 41, Jesus said to his disciples, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus knows that we are frail and through prayer we can be strengthened in our soul against temptation. Lastly, number five, why pray? Because prayer is the pathway for forgiveness. We all need forgiveness because we have all sinned. Sin separates us from God. But 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, if we give our sins to God, say, Lord, you know my sins. Lord, I confess them to you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we would just go to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. He will cleanse our hearts. Prayer is a pathway to forgiveness. King David, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then was confronted by the prophet Nathan. David was cut to the heart. He repented. He was broken. And he wrote Psalm 51. All of Psalm 51 is a prayer of confession, repentance, and contrition before God. And part of it goes like this. In Psalm 51, 1 and 2, David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression." Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And later in that chapter, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. If you want to get closer to God, pray. If you're sick and need healing, pray. If you're worried or fearful, pray. If you're tempted, pray. If you need answers to questions, pray. If you're in doubt, pray. And if you don't know what else to do, then by all means, pray. pray. Amen. John Bunyan said this about prayer. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for this reminder, Lord. A simple prayer of Hezekiah is that you honored. You extended his life. You were merciful. He didn't even ask for it. Thank you for the wonderful ways you're so merciful in our lives that we don't even sometimes know to ask or how to ask. Nevertheless, you tell us to come, to ask. You delight to show yourself strong in our lives. Your will be done, Lord, not ours. Thank you for your comfort. Thank you for how you help us with anxiety, fear, worry, and temptation. Thank you that it is a pathway for forgiveness. Lord, we rob ourselves when we don't take time with you. We rob ourselves. Oh, that you would so want to calm our fears if we would only pray. Oh, how you want to strengthen us through our temptations if we would only pray. You want to take away our fears if we would just simply pray. Forgive us when we're so busy, Lord. We do a disservice to ourselves. May we be disciplined in our lives, unhurried, to be able to just take that time that we need to sit at your feet. Sometimes just to listen. What would you say to me today, Lord? How would you encourage me or challenge me? Thank you for being my father. Thank you for caring for me and loving me. For looking out for me and protecting me and providing for me. Lord, all the many ways that you're so good to us. Help us to take time to pray. You're a good and merciful God. And we thank you that you have made a way for us to commune and connect with you through the wonderful avenue of prayer. We thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.